Part two, folks. The uh, battery, uh, battery, my phone cam, right out of map. Rad. Can I start over? Take two. This is part two. Sorry about that, but my phone cam ran out of memory and shut down. So here's part two. So where I was is I just got a job at Scenic Airlines in Grand Canyon Airport. They got twin otters, a fleet of them. Uh, and so what would happen is people would book in, in uh, uh, Las Vegas to fly to the Grand Canyon. And on the way uh, from uh, Vegas to South Rim Grand Canyon Airport, they received either on the way there or on the way back to Vegas, depending on uh, weather and whatnot, uh, on, on one, one direction or the other on this round-trip flight from Vegas to Grand Canyon, uh, the passengers would have a tour of the canyon. So, uh, uh, so, it's, it was, so let's say it was on the way out. Uh, which I think was often the case, if I recall correctly. They let, take off from McCarran Airport in Las Vegas, and they fly toward the Grand Canyon, and then they fly along the Grand Canyon. They're not in it, because that's not uh, uh, illegal. Uh, they have to be, I believe, oh, geez, can I remember? It's 1,500 feet above the rim for uh, rotorcraft, helicopters. That's as low as they can go at Grand Canyon. 1,500 feet, and then I think it's 2,000 feet, 2,200, something like that for fixed wing. So something like that. Somewhere around uh, 2,000 feet or, 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 more, or a little more. Uh, so you get on the plane in Vegas, you fly toward the Grand Canyon, and then you fly along and above the South Rim at about 2,000 feet. Uh, but there's nothing out there but Grand Canyon, and it is spectacular. Spectacular. You can see the Colorado River below. Uh, you can see both rims. You can see all the sculpted uh, landscape in, within the canyon and the inner canyon. And the skies are always just spectacular, spectacular, mind-blowing. There's oftentimes weather, sometimes really severe weather, which we're going to talk about. Uh, so you get, you know, board the aircraft in Vegas, fly along and above the, the Grand Canyon. Just unbelievable, mind-blowing, spectacular flight lasting about 30 minutes, something like that. And then you land at Grand Canyon Airport, and uh, you'd go into the little airport. That you, if you are, were staying, you know, more than... If you some of the folks were staying overnight too or longer, you know, they'd come in on Scenic Airlines. Sometimes they would do a, a day visit there, get back on a return flight the same day, go back to Vegas. Some would do that. Some would stay one or more nights at one of the lodges. Um, and then there was there was uh, options, uh, add-on options to the flight itself. And so, anyway, so so first folks would come in and land in the Twin Otters. And if they had baggage, just like a regular airport, uh, one of the things I did uh, was a ramp. I was a ramp agent, so one of the things that would happen is when a plane landed, uh, when a twin otter, twin otters, when twin otters, as many as six, you know, or seven even, would come in, you know, in succession, busy tourist season, lots of these flights going on, uh, so they'd come in, and I whip out there in my little tug, uh, vehicle uh, with uh, two trailers on the back for luggage. And I'd cruise out there and fly up under the uh, up under the twin otter once it was safe to do so, and then I'd open up the uh, the cargo doors, and I'd start yanking that luggage out of that cargo compartments on twin twin otters and throwing them onto those uh, those uh, tug uh, trailers as quick as I could, as quick as I could. And there was three cargo compartments: one aft, one forward, and one more, kind of sort of midsection. So I throw all that stuff out. And I wouldn't throw it, but I'd really move super fast and uh, unload all the aircraft. Of their car, of their baggage, and if there was a lot of planes, it'd be somebody other than me helping. Um, so I, I or we, depending on how many planes, I would unload all the cargo, and uh, drive that over to the uh, baggage pickup area, and I start putting that on the conveyor belt for the folks to go ahead and pick up their luggage. Uh, we'd make sure that it was their luggage. They'd have to show us their tag, and they'd pick up their luggage at the carousel, their little mini carousel at Grand Canyon Airport. And uh, so that was one of the things I did. I also would load baggage for outgoing flights. Now, this is really interesting. As a ramp agent, uh, I was responsible for uh, weight and balance and CG of the twin of the twin otter full of people and cargo. And uh, so you had your forward compartment, your more or less mid compartment, and your aft compartment. Now, each of those had a weight limit, a weight limit. So you couldn't go over the limit in any of those. And and also, some flights you wouldn't fill them completely. So. You, so you had you had a weight limit for each uh, compartment, and you also had a general idea of of what the ratio was of weight. You know, the nose compartment would take this much, mid this much weight, aft this much weight. Well, if you had half as much cargo as normal, it would be more or less the same ratio, but just less luggage, if you understand what I'm saying. So, and you'd do a weight and balance. You'd have to calculate it. You'd, because uh, you, you had the weight on every bag. 
So you uh, throw the bag, you look at the weight on the bag that you're throwing into the cargo compartment, you write it down, you throw it in the cargo compartment. Pretty soon you get a list of weights of all the bags that you've thrown in the cargo compartment so far, and you add it up, and that tells you your total weight for that compartment, and if, if you have to make sure it's in the safety range and not exceeding that. So that was one thing that was interesting to do, is also load the aircraft. Uh, another thing I would do, would, would uh, I would uh, use the uh, APU, auxiliary power unit, to uh, start the Twin Otters. You know, there'd be a fleet loaded with passengers, loaded with cargo, ready to take off. I'd whip out there in this uh, tug, uh, little vehicle you see them at airports, a little driving thing, on the tug and, uh, with uh, towing an APU, an auxiliary power unit. And I'd pull up to the side of the plane, open up a little door on the side of the fuse, uh, towards the aft side, pilot side. What's pilot side? I forget. Anyway, and I'd plug in a big cable to the Twin Otter, and that would uh, start the Twin Otter off the little trailer that I was towing. It would start up, I'd pull the cable off, you know, close the door, and I'd drive away uh, with the tug and the auxiliary power unit, and the aircraft would take off. So that was an interesting job. <clears throat> I also worked as, uh, as a dispatcher, aircraft dispatcher, which is really interesting and really important. Uh, I had to uh, do some uh, training, and uh, I think I had to do a test, and then I had, had, then I had an FAA uh, license at that point as an aircraft dispatcher, commercial aircraft dispatcher. And so normally the the, the airplanes would communicate. We would uh, part of it was the uh, our, our airplanes on the tarmac would communicate with me or whoever was the dispatcher, just back and forth what they were doing, preparing to take off and this and that. Uh, so that was the way. Uh, this dispatcher was the way of for the pilots to communicate with the uh, the with the uh, the uh, operation at the at the airport there. And uh, and then also. Uh, and here's the interesting thing is I had a situation where weather was really bad and they were heading out. It was nine, I think it was nine aircraft, nine twin otters full of people and, and cargo heading for Vegas. And they ran into storm conditions and it got worse and worse. And it was up to me, me, Mark Thomas, it was up to me to decide whether or not these uh, nine twin otters full of people should turn around and come back to the Grand Canyon for safety reasons. Now, if they turn around and come back, people are going to be PO'd and disappointed because you know, they had reservations to stay the night in Vegas. Now they can't go to Vegas. It can just screw up people's plans big time. And the company's not too crazy about it either because they fly for a while and come back and they've used that fuel and haven't earned any revenue. And it's, it can just, it's, it's not good for anybody. But the same token, but anyway, so you have to really balance that, you know, because if, you, if you're overcautious and you turn some around, uh, turn flights around, pilots are going to be PO'd at you, the customers and, and your own, uh, you know, managers and supervisors and stuff. Anyway, so I had a, a situation where the weather was bad like that, and, and I had to make the call, and it wasn't an easy call, uh, but I erred on the side of caution, uh, and uh, it turned out to be a good call. So that was cool. That, so that was part that was part of the job. Really interesting, as you can see. This, I'm, I'm learning so much about planes now in this one little airport at Grand Canyon, and all these different jobs I'm working, and all the uh, planes that come in, just, uh, you know, uh, private planes that I get to look at, and anytime I want to go look at the interior, they always, I would ask the pilot, and they'd always let me do it. Anyway, so I do that. Um, what else? And then, of course, on my days off, uh, you know, I got to have a free flight anytime I wanted to on uh, Scenic Airlines 